thank you very much, Alan. That was, uh, that was most enlightening. And um, if you ever tire of being a GP, you'd make an excellent red tourist bus guide for Belfast. Uh, we'll hear from the chairs of uh, Scotland and Wales tomorrow. Uh, we're going to move on now to um, uh, motion number six on the agenda. And I'd like to call Dr. Lucy Henschel from Suffolk to propose the motion. Krishna, you're not Lucy. Good afternoon, conference. It's a real pleasure to be here in the city of my birth. I also trained with Scottish and Welsh GPs, so I speak about us all. But I would like to tell you about Richard Bennett. Rich was in the year above me at medical school in Sheffield. Kind, funny, really bright. He already had an English literature degree under his belt. He loved poetry. He was a keen and competitive runner, very successful, and a frustrated rock guitarist. Everybody adored Rich. His first GP partnership was a rather damaging experience, so he moved briefly into public health and then came back to his real passion, caring for patients in general practice, becoming my husband's full-time partner in Felixstowe in Suffolk. Our kids played together by the sea. Rich and Annabelle are close friends, not just colleagues, in a small practice, in a small seaside town. Richie loved nothing better than singing along to Disney films with his gorgeous girls, Holly and Rosie. As a GP trainer, he inspired a generation, astute clinician, compassionate, really skilled and a joy to work with. And then later, he worked for a charity assessing the psychological and physical in injuries of victims of torture who were seeking asylum in Britain. Richie is exactly the kind of doctor that we all want to see when we are sick or scared or dying. On December the 30th, 2013, Richie drove 20 miles from his house and jumped under a train. I wish that this was a one-off tragedy, but the ONS statistics for 2011 to 2015, in England and Wales alone, reveal that 430 health professionals died by suicide. 81 of them were doctors. If these were World War I soldiers, there would be a Commonwealth War Graves cemetery with rows of white headstones, each one acknowledging the self-sacrifice of a named individual. But I see no memorial for the NHS fallen, no thanks for the life of service and for what they gave. The systemic failure of the NHS and wider society to properly look after GPs who dedicate their lives to the caring of others is as barbaric as sending those young men over the top, unprotected, unsupported, undervalued as human beings, almost expendable. And so across the four nations, GPs working flat out in appalling conditions and under relentless hostile fire from all sides. And back to Ritchie. General practice had made him ill. He'd had two long periods off work with depression. A complaint landed just as he came back from a family holiday and it changed him irreversibly. Returning from subsequent holidays, he would go to the surgery days before he was due to return to work just to check emails and look at the post and in fear. He took ill health retirement before he was 50 to try and rescue his mental health, but the damage was all done. Conference, we know that one in three GPs suffer from burnout, depression, or both. We know female doctors have four times the suicide risk of the general population. We also know in England, in the GP health service for which I work, that the average age at presentation is now just 38. The NHS general practice life is breaking people because the system fails to support us in our daily work and then fails to mend us if we fall ill. 38% of 
of NHS staff report feeling bullied, harassed or discriminated against. And instead of being seen as intelligent adults and medical professionals, we are scolded like naughty children. And yet, we are still meant to just cope, without complaining, for decades. And so, Conference, we demand that the multiple adverse forces that are impacting on the mental health of GPs be named and tackled before they lead to more suicides. We charge GPC to pursue this whole issue in each of the four nations at every single opportunity and to keep on doing so and again and again until the tide is turned and what we need is put in place in all four nations. And I personally will be holding Matt Hancock to account for something he said in a speech last month about building a just and caring culture and valuing NHS staff. He said, we need to place as much importance on the care of the carers as the patients. And I agree, but we need actions, not words. As GPs, we deserve more than signposting to mindfulness. Resilience didn't protect those young men going over the top at the Somme. Resilience alone will not keep GPs safe and well. Conference, GPC, it is time to speak up for Richie, for Wendy Potts, for Sophie Spooner, for all the others before, since and to come to tell their stories and to demand what we need to be able to do our jobs. We deserve to be cared for ourselves, supported and encouraged in our daily work, valued and cared for when we are well, and most of all cared for if we become unwell. Because conference, we are also human. I move. Thank you, Lucy. I know that was very hard for you. Uh, I'd like to call Chandra Kanagati uh, from the GPC, who would like to speak against little four of this motion. Thanks, Chair. Conference, uh, like Lucy, I also work for GP Health, which supports GPs with uh, mental health problems. And uh, I'm here to speak against little four, but speaking very much in support of uh, all the remaining three parts. Suicide is an important issue amongst all doctors now. The cause of suicide is so complex and is often a toxic mixer and is combined with the trigger factor which amongst doctors is most often not a complaint. What is important in terms of prevention is to deal with the underlying issues. Lowering the risk of suicide means addressing the workplace issues, the lack of teamwork, the lack of space for doctors to talk about the emotional impact of their work, the lack of supervision, and the GPs, the unbelievable pressure we are under to deliver the impossible targets. GP Health has found that GPs have the highest rate of mental illness and burnout than any other specialities. GPs are expected to be the scapegoat and savior of the NHS when all we want to do is to work safely. GPs are trapped in an every moving merry-go-round are having to deliver more and more to a higher degree of complexity with diminishing resources. At the same time, we're expected to see more face-to-face -face patients than any other medical group. Conference, that is what making us sick. Looking at the motion, little one, as of course, GMC are doing a lot of work on this, health education are doing this big piece of work, but the issue here is GP colleagues. GPs are suffering specifically and within our colleagues, specifically BME GP colleagues, who are often more isolated, more discriminated against, less able to seek help. We need to make sure they are supported. Little too, again, this is being done to a lot of initiatives currently to train in England. 
we should focus on those kind of groups like older GPs who are struggling to maintain their practice, BME doctors who are complained about more, doctors returning from out of practice due to mental illness or regulatory sanctions who cannot find a way on. And little for I'm not I'm opposing it because we have done enough surveys, a lot of surveys have been done. We have photographed the issue many times. University of Manchester have been doing a series of surveys in the last 20 years using the same methodology. We don't need more surveys, we need more actions now. And please support one, two, three fully. Thank you. Thank you, Chandra. I'd like to call Dr. Mark Fawcett from Glasgow LMC, who's speaking in favour of the motion. Good morning. Good morning, I chimed to my 15th patient that morning. Morning, doctor, he replied cheerfully. How are you, doc? Crap, I replied. Oh, that's good, he replied. It's my toe, doc. I think I have an athlete's foot again. It's very itchy. I sometimes threw in the odd random honest reply to the morning pleasantries and have never been surprised yet by the lack of awareness or empathy the nicest of people in my practice have. I tend to the toe and prescribe a cream that can be readily bought over the, the counters of the three pharmacists he had to pass to get to me, and that will cost the NHS ten times its retail value. My clinic started at 9 a.m., and it is now 11.45. He, he was my 15th face-to-face -face patient that morning, and I have three more supposedly before 12. I've telephoned six other patients regarding results and letters, I've dealt with 20 blood results, one which indicates a possible cancer, made three referrals and spoken to both a social worker and a mental health nurse. I actually have been in the building and dealing with a hamster wheel as my entry since 7.50 and allowed myself one toilet break. Toilet. Strangely enough, a few months back it was a simple universal of functions that finally made me realise that something wasn't quite right with the demands of general practice were having on me. I recall being annoyed, really annoyed, I actually peed off one particular morning. My, deal, my daily colonic requirements that day meant that I would miss my window of uh, the rush hour. I wouldn't get to work till 8.45 at the earliest. I would not have time to catch up on the work from the previous day that the childcare demands had stopped. I was annoyed at having to do the most basic of human functions because it would make my work life day bad. I found myself planning then to get to work even earlier each day to try and miss the rush hour and to deal with the functions at work. I caught myself reflecting on the ridiculousness of my reaction to this scenario and of my solution. Then I realised it dawned on me like the realisation of a wave of attrition. This was just one of many adjustments, sacrifices, impositions, sleepless nights and mind-numbing fatigues that I had been enduring for the last 20 years. Had it cost me my first marriage? I don't know. Had I lost touch with friends due to lack of being able to keep dates or too tired to entertain nights out? Have I been too restrictive on my kids and been too stressed in my own world to see the effect on them and how much they have grown? Not sure, but I can't say no either. It's impossible to get an appointment here. I've been trying to get an appointment with you for the last two years, was the most amusing statement given to me at the patient that morning. He couldn't get to see me yesterday for his cold, but had managed miraculously to navigate the system today. He then proceeded to, to demand a prescription for paracetamol, it would have been 16 pence over the counter, whilst throwing expletives my way for not prescribing the antibiotics that he always got for his cold. After all, he had paid his taxes. Mark, could I ask you to draw to a close, please? Thank you. I gave him his paracetamol and a continuation of the fit note he'd had for the last five years. He leaves, and before I can call my next patient in, Reception called to ask me to speak to a patient on the phone who's having chest pain. Hi, doctor. How are you? Fine, thanks. How can I help? Thank you. I'd like to call Dr. Anu Rao from Leicestershire LMC, who is speaking against the motion. Thank you, Chair. Conference. I'm opposing little one and little four. I'm very grieved by them both. Why? Let me explain. Since 2016, we have had statistics and we require more. We have conducted numerous surveys after surveys, all prove the same point. 
GPs are overwhelmed by relentless demand, high patient expectations, bureaucracy, CQC, complaints, etc., etc. GPs have one of the highest incidences of anxiety, depression, alcohol, and substance misuse. Okay, so we do need statistics, do we? I shall give you some. Survey of 800 GPs by Pulse in 2017 revealed 11% had turned to alcohol, 6% to prescription drugs. Survey of more than 1,000 GPs by Mind, 40% said they were experiencing mental health problems. More statistics for you. Female doctors are up to four times more likely to take their own lives compared to their counterparts in other professions. And the sad part is as GPs, we feel ashamed to acknowledge all of this due to fear of being judged. As LMCs, many of us support our colleagues in time of difficulty, and recently I was shocked to hear one of my GP colleagues say they felt receiving a complaint was worse than receiving a cancer diagnosis. And we are here debating for short survey tools. Conference, I'm sorry, but it's time we face the reality. We focus for pressing for tangible resources that can be quickly implemented to make a real difference to all frontline GPs. Thank you. And please, can I also make a plea? When these resources come, they need to be ring-fenced and given to the LMCs to deliver and implement, not to NHS England or CCGs. Conference, it's time for action not surveys. I move. Thank you. I'd like to call Dr. Sarah Westerbeek uh, from Kent LMC, who's speaking in favour of the motion. Chair, conference, suicide. It's a word that strikes fear into the heart of all of us. Professionally, we frantically rack our brains trying to think of the signs we may have missed the clues we didn't pick up on, and the opportunities to intervene when, we intervene when we didn't. Personally, we do the same, but with only increased anguish and pain. Unfortunately, the sad fact is that now, not only are we having to manage the tragic loss of some of our patients, but increasingly, we're now having to cope with the loss of our peers, as well as dealing with our own increased rates of anxiety, depression, and mental health problems. Make no mistake, this is a crisis. As we've already heard, over 400 doctors died by suicide in the past four years, with female doctors having four times an increased risk of suicide in the general population. We must ask the question, why? In addition to universal factors that contribute to suicide risk, such as illness and loss, we know that doctor-specific factors, including complaints from the public and GMC investigations, also contribute to this risk. Barriers are in place that prevent doctors, and I believe especially GPs, from seeking help. These include a fear of confidentiality and their perceived fitness to practice. Like many others in this room today, I've had first-hand experience at feeling at one time that I needed help and support with my own mental health but I didn't know where to turn. Like many of you, my own GP was somebody who I knew, somebody who I go to educational meetings with, and someone who knows all of my colleagues. I was worried about the implications of any diagnosis or label and potential longer impact on me professionally. At the time, there was no access to the PHP, and that it only served London GPs, or the GP Health Service, which thankfully there is now. However, we must ensure that all of these services are available to all practitioners in all geographical locations at all times in their career and beyond. And most importantly, we absolutely must continue to ensure that all removable factors, such as excessive workload and limited liabilities and excessively long and stressful GMC investigations are identified and removed. An increased risk of suicide is an entirely unacceptable occupational hazard, and we must act now. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Now, conference, I have a number of other speakers all wishing to speak in favour of this motion. 
I hear that you might like to put this to a vote. Can I see your cards, please, if you would like to vote? Thank you. If you would like to hear more debate? Thank you. Uh, so we're going to go to uh, Chair of um, Policy Group. Thank you very much, Mark, and I just want to thank all the speakers um, for sharing their stories um, and their experiences. And unfortunately, we know that this is not unusual. Um, as the last speaker said, it is unacceptable that we have an increased risk as doctors. It's a crisis. And as GPs, we're working in unprecedented pressures, increasingly hostile and unforgiving environments. So we need action and we need it now. The only point I would say is little fall with regards to the survey, the BMA produced a burnout survey which has been used extensively and people have self-identified themselves as being at risk and referred themselves in. We need action and we need it now. So I would just ask the speaker to consider taking that as a reference please. Thank you. Thank you. A proposal in reply. Now we've heard that um, uh, the, um, you might like to consider taking part four as a reference. We've yep. also heard some opposition to little one, so if you could address those, that would be great. Thank you. I'm very grateful to those who have spoken for reinforcing the message and the specifics. Um, with regard to little four, I would be happy to accept that as a reference with the proviso that GPC puts an extra pint of energy into everything else. I agree. We have all those surveys. We need action. So yes, that's absolutely fine. The issue with little one, I think I lost slightly. I think I was debriefing myself after quite a difficult speech. Personally, I think one to three should be voted unanimously because we have a duty beyond this room to get this message out there. This is a dirty secret of life in general practice and we are at the point where we need this fixing. And so I would ask that not only GPC put every ounce of energy, but every single person in this room can make a difference when they go back to their corners of the four nations. So that would be my suggestion. Little four as a reference, and the other three, please, as they stand. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Right. So I intend to take this motion in, in parts. So, um, uh, so little one, those in favour? Uh, those against? I see one against. Okay. Little, uh, little two, those in favour? Uh, those against? And I don't see any against. Uh, any abstentions? That is unanimous. Uh, part three, those in favour? Uh, those against? Was that an against? No? Okay. Uh, um, so none, none against. Any uh, abstentions? Okay, that is unanimous. And part four, as a reference, those in favour? Uh, those against? A few against, so that is carried. Thank you very much indeed. Now, before we move on to motion six, we do have a little bit of time in hand. I think it would be appropriate for us to have one minute silence uh, to remember Richie, Wendy, Sophie, uh, the 400 other doctors who've uh, taken their own lives in the last four years. So, shall we stand together and have one minute silence, please? Thank you, conference. Thank you. Now we are running very slightly ahead of time. We were running very, very ahead of time. Um, and I did allow all the speakers in that last motion to, uh, to speak for longer than their allotted time. 
but I'm afraid I, I can't afford to do that for the rest of the conference. Uh, we're going to move on now to motion seven, and I'd like to call Dr. Kieran Kelly uh, from North and East Lincolnshire, who is going to propose the motion and who is a first-time speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.